Hey everyone, it's Jessica J. Sadasan here for Tamil Culture, back with another very interesting discussion. And I think in this case, interesting is probably an understatement. Uh, a more apt word or phrase would probably be necessary, uh, long overdue, and potentially uncomfortable. Um, but it's a conversation that we as individuals and members of the Tamil community need to be having uh, in light of the times that we are in. Um, and it's certainly not new times, it's just the manifestation of old times over and over again. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement. We're talking about the Tamil community's proximity to the Black Lives Matter movement. Whether it's a Tamil issue, is it an issue that we should care about? Is it an issue that our history as Tamil people should inform? Um, and our relationship to black culture out here in the West, um, whether it's been simply a relationship of consumption, uh, fair weather friendship, uh, or whether we've truly been allies to the black community out here. So to unpack all that nitty gritty and get into all that meaning, I had three individuals with me that came together to talk about their personal experiences uh, growing up in the West and their own personal relationship with the black community, with black culture, and their proximity to the Black Lives Matter movement. So we had Radean Simon Pole. Radean is a film critic and culture writer for CTV and Now Magazine. We also had Rashani Vignaraja. She is an Ontario public servant and the chair of Tamils in Public Service. And we had Sean Vincent Nepal, recording artist and producer based out here in Toronto. So on that note, Let's get into the discussion. Uh, at least for me, it's been a week of immense discomfort, a, a few weeks of immense discomfort, just sitting with my own realizations, my own hard truths. Um, and I think that period of personal reflection is good, but I'd much rather just chat it out with you guys um, and, and check myself a little and hopefully check all our understandings about a topic as big as this. Because I think um, that's really how we're gonna come to an understanding as a community about it. So to that effect, I have three fellow humans with me and fellow Tamil Canadians with me today for what I hope can be a little period of virtual reflection for all of us. Um, I won't be surprised if our viewers at home know all of you already. You're kind of familiar names, I think, but I'm going to introduce you all uh, just in case people don't know who you are. First up, uh, you probably caught him on CTV News. You probably caught him critiquing the latest film release or interviewing your favorite celeb. We have Rade and Simon Pillay, film critic and culture writer for CTV and Now Magazine. Rad, how's hey, it going? Hey, how's it going? It's going. Um, what's your what's your thoughts on this conversation? Your preliminary thoughts, briefly. Oh, we're just gonna dive right into that. <laughs> well, I just want to get a you know your intention. Your what's your feeling right now as we as we get into this? There's just so many feelings, though, right? Like, okay, so I mean, I guess for me, like. I, I'm here to listen a lot of the times when I, I mean, like you, you, like you said, I work at CTV. I'm surrounded by, you know, people like Tyrone Edwards, who had a really emotional, emotional moment when he processed this. I don't know if you saw, he broke down and cried, cried on the social, trying to just to get his, ex, uh, express his feelings. We've had a shitload of stuff happening over there. Uh, you know, they had a special with anti-black racism and they had some shit that complicated that special. And I mean, I don't want to get into that because uh, I just don't know where to land on that stuff. But, um, but I mean, like, I've just been like, I've been listening, I've been observing. I wrote, I tried to do my best writing a story uh, for at Now Magazine about policing and anti-black racism and how how all of this just affects black people's mental health whether you are i mean like whether i mean just in terms of being a black person having to see these headlines how does that how does that affect your sense of self-worth how does that affect of your relationship with the world uh, i tried to explore that in that piece that's that was my end and then after that i just needed to pull myself back i took i'm taking like a month off vacation from now magazine right now just because it's all just too heavy for me um but yeah i'm i'm here to listen and then i'm here to i am I'm, i am observing brown people and i'm uh, tamil people south asian people whatever we are and even if it's white people like we got to stop trying to center ourselves in these conversations like, that's something we're going to try and unpack as we get along as we go on with this mm -hmm. absolutely um you're right i don't think any of us really know um what it's like to go day in and day out having to consider what my day is going to be like mm -hmm. having to walk around with that i think I think us as, as a Tamil community, we might know that in a past life, but I don't think we really know that in our life here in the West, right? Mm -hmm. So that's really been sitting with me because despite whatever discomfort I might be feeling, it's nothing. 
it's absolutely nothing compared to what our black friends and colleagues are going through. Uh, I'm definitely with you on that. Um, all right, so next up with us, we have someone who's no stranger to panels about tough topics. Uh, she's provided her insights on TVO's agenda and CBC. We have Rishani Vigaraja, Ontario Public Servant and Chair of Tamils in Public Service. Roche, how's it going? What's on your mind? What's, what's been right. on your mind these past few weeks? Oh man, um, definitely a lot of honest, <coughs> uncomfortable introspection. You know, this is in different levels. So there's like an individual level, there's, you know, myself as a public servant, and then what that means for, you know, the community work that I'm doing within the Tamil community as well. So there's like different roles uh, uh, involved and all coming back to a sense of personal responsibility, right? Um, so, you know, being a public servant, you know, there's this quote that I saw, um, acknowledging you are a part of a racist machine is not easy. And that's what I've been thinking about a lot, honestly, mm -hmm. uh, working for the provincial bureaucracy, because I am a part of the system. I have a role in it. And, you know, every so often, uh, before the series of events that were that took place, um, and now during and, and following, I, I, I like to check myself, you know, to see uh, <coughs> my role within the government might make me complicit to the ways in which the system reinforces and reinforces things like anti-black racism, colonialism, uh, you name it, all the uh, all the forms of oppressions that that we've seen the government historically and to this day kind of um acting out on. So to an extent, I know that my role does make me complicit a little bit, but um, as much as I try to be that sort of systems navigator that seeks to add my perspective and challenge when necessary and be that person that calls it out. Uh, I am complicit in some ways, uh, mm -hmm. especially being in like the minister ministry of the solicitor general. Um, for those of you that are familiar, that involves overseeing corrections and public safety and community safety. Um, it's also the home of the anti-racism directorate. So, um, you know, being a racialized woman that strongly values change for the better for the most marginalized of our society whether it be the Dhamma community or beyond that, in the true sense of the term of allyship, you know, I have a personal responsibility and a decision to make almost daily. Uh, you know, do I sit back and keep quiet because it's the easier thing to do and, you know, for the, for the benefit of my career maybe, or do I speak up and challenge things and, and face whatever I face uh, in doing that? So, you know, like there's my own personal feelings and the emotions that I had to sit with, but um, it immediately turned into like, okay, it's time for action. Like, what are we going to do? How are we going to hold ourselves accountable? And, you know, and more, most importantly, how are we going to sustain whatever momentum that is to ensure that, you know, Black Lives Matter isn't just like the flavor of the month, right? So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Whew. Yeah. I think uh, we're just all coming to realize that if we didn't know it before, it's like, it's really in our face now that, yeah, we were part of this system. We contributed to it. We played along to this. We played along. Uh, and it's, I think a lot of it is because we didn't want to disrupt a sense of comfort that was benefiting us to some extent. So hard truths, right? All right. Our last friend on the panel. Uh, you already know who he is if you were bumping best friends earlier today, like I was. Uh, we have Sean Vincent Paul recording artist and director based in Toronto, who's been shaking up the music scene <laughs> in Toronto and worldwide, just having done a tour in India. Um, Juan, hey. how, how is it coming back to, from India to this? Oh man, I think we, uh, we left just as uh, COVID started, where like quarantine started. So we, were, we made the cut by a, a week. So we were pretty lucky actually, in terms of just traveling and tour. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of what's going on right now, it's, we're living in a very important moment right now. And, um, I think for me, that's is one, like Rad was saying, is a lot of listening, a lot of listening to the black community and letting them lead the conversation. That's important to me. Um, and I think for me, it's been, how could I contribute purposefully and honestly in this fight. You know, I have made a career out of black music and black culture. Um, so I'm in this, I feel uh, maybe more of a responsibility than the average Tamil person um, right now. 
just because it's been my livelihood. So there's like, I think for anybody that's participated in the black community, in the black space, there is a certain debt that we do owe. And I feel like how could we continue to participate within this culture? Um, and yeah, and just questioning our, our community's role. Because when you think about how we were brought up and our, um, a lot of Tamil people's perspective and views on the black community was always one that was either fear or admiration, but rarely respect. And that made me think like how now, where are we as a community and how could we contribute in what's going on right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's so well put. Fear and admiration, but rarely respect. I think that kind of nails it. Just fucking end the podcast now. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I think we covered it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like... um, no, I think, yeah, you nailed it really with that. I think, I feel like the Tamil community in Toronto, um, maybe in particular, but maybe in general, has a really a really interesting relationship with the black community here. And I For think sure. because, you know, we have a really complicated racial identity here in Toronto, I think, you know, we're, we're, yeah, we're South Asian, um, sure, but we're not basic in the, in the way that I don't think Indian people or, or other South Asians intended us to be. I think, I think we also inherently know that in the South Asian racial ladder, Tamil people are not, we're kind of at the bottom and a lot of it has to do with the color of our skin, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But somehow inherently, despite that, despite knowing that, we somehow know that in the, in the bigger racial ladder, we're at least one rung higher than black people, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, I think it, it's, it's showing it for me when I re reflect on my experiences, you know, growing up in Toronto, um, you know, I didn't really, I couldn't really identify as a Desi person or a South Asian, Those, that, that wasn't my jam. Um, I'm definitely not white and black culture and black music, black music has been the soundtrack to my life. You know, it's the, really has, it's been, it's, it's spoken to me in this way. And, and, I've, and I've gotten a lot of value and joy and comfort from it um, without realizing that I might've been just consuming it without really understanding or really caring about the lived experiences of those people. Um, but yeah, I wonder what, what your individual relationship with the black community has been like, you know, growing up here. Um, Brad, why don't we start with you? Well, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I, I'm almost scared to talk about this. So like, okay, so I grew up in Tuxedo Court, right? Um, I grew up in Tuxedo Court in the 80s. The thing about Tuxedo Court is, I mean, right now, if you go back there, it's all Pakistani and stuff, people. But when I was growing up, it was me, maybe two other Tamil families, maybe. Mm -hmm. And it was all black, West Indian, whatnot people. And we went to school. It's a, a school, an elementary school called St. Thomas More. Here's the thing. I, I'm growing up, I could be discriminated against by white people. And I could just be discriminated against by black people because I'm neither, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially when you are the only Tamil in that neighborhood. But in the end, you choose a side. And of course, you choose the black people because they are the ones. First of all, you, there's, I mean, you know how they talk about racial passing? Uh, yeah. where like, you know, it's like certain mixed colored black people could pass as white. Well, I was a Tamil guy that could sometimes, you know, as soon as you get rid of that big, th 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 thick head of hair, that you trim it down. I was able, people thought I was Jamaican or Trini or whatnot. So uh, there was like, so if I'm hanging out with them, that's who I identified with. In fact, so I grew up with a lot of self-hate. Like, and I'm only admitting this now as a fucking 40 year old, almost old. I'm not 40 yet. I'm not, I'm not doing age myself, but yeah, like, but, um, I think I grew up with a lot of self hate and I wanted to identify with that community, but of course I can't identify with the experience of that community. And I look at, I, I you know, like I say that now because I, I look at all the things that benefited me and benefit, like basically all the friends I grew up with back then, those friends I'm talking about, those childhood friends that are black, they ended up in prison. Right. So my childhood friends, like one of them, you know, for stealing cars, ended up going to this kind of juvie, got moved away here. Another one went over there. And I so I me being the only one that had both parents and both families and not this history of trauma. We had a very different type of trauma, but not that trauma. I succeeded in a way that those friends didn't. Um, so uh, that was that experience. So there was I mean, and but when you talk about that complicated relationship where, you know, we both have this affection for black culture, but we could also be discriminated against i mean i don't know how shan i don't know how old you all are but shan i think is the only one that might might vaguely remember this 
the Tamil gangs that popped up in the mid nineties, we're right. talking about like that AKBVT stuff. A lot of those gangs popped up. One of the things that, that predicated them popping up was a certain hostility against other black gangs. It was like, you know, we, they, like, if you think about Tamil gangs grew up in Malvern, Mornell court, tuxedo court, and then on the West end, like Jane Fitch area. Mm-hmm. And so it was almost them, them collectively uh, like forming together in antagon in an antagonism against those groups. Right. So you have to remember that in our little history, like, so these Tamil gangs and these guys and these dudes would love reggae music, would be bumping that Sim Sima all of, you know, like out of their civics and all that shit. But at the same time, they would also have a certain hate and an animosity towards those people. There's a lot of complicated feelings that come with that. Like, so like, um, it just in terms of what is our relationship to the culture? Do we like, are these people our friends or are we going to like, are we like, are we fair weather friends? You know, like, uh, and I think that's what the Tamil, I think that's what it is. I think the Tamil community can be fair weather friends when it comes to their relationship with black, the black community. Just to chime in on that, Rad, mm-hmm. could, could you not say it's aside from the Tamil community, that's a small mirror of our world. That's how we treat black people is we take, 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 mm-hmm. we take culture, we take style, we take slang, we take music, we take food, we take aesthetic, everything we take. But when it's time to give or show up, mm-hmm. nobody's there to show up. And now we're seeing this paradigm shift of people being, a lot of people are showing up out of sheer guilt. I don't give a shit. Show up now. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? yeah. It's, and I feel like that is a mirror. It's like, that's us, but I feel like that's just a larger society. It's just, it's essentially black culture is always pillaged, but nobody is there to return anything. You know what I mean? What's the contribution now? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can I, uh, so like, sorry, bounce back on that. Uh, I don't know if y'all listened to a podcast we did recently about Lily Singh. Mm, yeah, I did. Are we, are we getting? Are we going to get into Lily Singh today? Is like, is that <laughs> is that something we're going to talk about later on, or should we get just right into that now? <laughs> huh? You can get to it now. Let's hear it. No, but I mean, I think so. Like, it's interesting because she's so emblematic of us as brown people, right? Like, she like and like 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 she doesn't even listen to the criticism from the black community. Where you know, this girl puts on that patois accent. She puts she goes out to like you know she makes she makes she profits off these videos. Uh, I mean, so the most recent we did the podcast on Lily Singh and Now Magazine, me and uh, black women as well as the Punjab women about after Lily Singh put out a video where she remixed Ding Dong's um, Bad Man Pull Up oh, Play. Yeah. That song to okay. the Yeah, like, and, and once again, doing the Patwa thing that she's already been criticized about. In <laughs> fact, and she can't deny that she's been criticized about it because I fucking, personally, I brought it to her face and I said, hey, <laughs> like, you know, like I, I interviewed her and I'm like, yo, like, what do you got to say about this? Because, you know, you're, you're, you're like, people have words to say. So she knows about the criticism and she still insists on doing it. So that's, what was your, that's one what was response when you mentioned it to her? She's like, oh, you know, the scar. But she was, I was like, okay, yeah, I know. You're going to tell me the Scarborough yeah. thing. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah but, you yeah, know, yeah. like if people, if people knew what it was like to grow up in Scarborough, if people really knew where we came from, I think they wouldn't criticize. She kind of generalized it like that, right? Mm-hmm. When Lily really Singh br- brings up the Scarborough argument, I was like, okay, first of all, I, I mean, I think, yeah, you, you had your time in Scarborough. But look at your crew right now. Yeah. Right? Like, I don't see any black people in your entourage. You, you had a, she had an entourage when I interviewed her. None of them were black. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's, a, that's an aside. But the thing about the Lily Singh thing, so she gets this criticism and she, she did what, what Shan described to a T. She takes and takes and takes and takes and then you got to ask, when does she give back, right? When this, all this stuff started going down with the George Floyd thing, um, uh, like oh, the, with Black, the Black Lives Matter conversation when it has been renewed, Lily Singh put out a post on Instagram and her post had the longest preface ever. Before getting into the Black Lives Matter argument, it had the longest preface ever about, I am Lily Singh and some people criticize me for wanting to support and some people criticize me about how I... So she made this post, half of this post was all about her and her struggle coming out and speaking out for the black community. So once again, she centered herself Mm -hmm. in a post where she's supposedly trying to be an ally for yeah. the black community. So and that's, that's what I'm seeing. That, that, that's, I think the, she's basically emblematic of a lot of us who yeah. will take this opportunity that would just take this opportunity to talk about racism, talk about discrimination, talk about oppression, and then try and recenter for ourselves. It's like, Oh yeah, yeah. By the way, remember we are that too. It's like, it's not our moment, you know? I'm, I'm glad you brought that up um, because uh, Roach, I think, you know, you and I have talked about this too. It seems like there's two conversations happening right now, right? Mm-hmm. There's, there's one addressing, the one that's affecting black people's lives, which is police brutality and the rate of violence and death um, in police interactions with the black community. Uh, 
you know, the fact that we shrug our shoulders at a statistic that says that black men are 20 times more likely to die in the city of Toronto at the hands of police. And we just say, eh, it's a problem for the black community. Um, that's kind of, that's just shocking to me now in hindsight, but I did it too, right? But anyway, you know, there's one conversation to be had around that um, and, and dismantling those systems, but we're also having a conversation about anti-black racism in our community. So, I mean, Roche, I feel like I don't even need to ask the question, but is there anti-black racism in the Tamil community? Yeah, yeah, heck yeah. Um, and the these all these and there's been a lot of conversations, you know, uh, you may see on social media about you know the role of the Tamil community and uh, in all of this. And in some ways, we are both the victims and the perpetrators of anti-black racism. Um, we can see how the community is starting to take more of a personal responsibility um, for how we contribute to anti-black racism. Um, but we're also seeing how this, you know, as Rad mentioned, we're starting to turn it into potentially centering it again around our own guilt and shaming. And um, that's just what it is. You know, when you mention Lily's long preface, the thing that comes to my head is that that's her guilt speaking out, you know, and, and she's, she's, she knows what she's, she's been contributing to. So she's, she's, that you see there is just the result of her guilt. And it just comes back to the work that we need to do internally as a community. Um, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement certainly benefits from this introspective discussion we've been having about what do we need to do uh, to combat anti-Black racism in our community, but that isn't what BLM is about. Like, yes, use your energy to have some discussions about how you can fix yourselves up in your community, but more than that, they need your energy to fight alongside them in solidarity with their liberation to eradicate white supremacy from our systems and our institutions. You know, the infighting that we're doing amongst ourselves, you know, while necessary for the progression of our community, it can be distracting and it is distracting to the momentum that BLM is building up on a more system wide level. Um, you know, both conversations are necessary and they need to be had. Um, we need to come to terms with how we contribute to white supremacy by reinforcing it in our own anti black racist actions against that community, you know, whether it be through the conversations, you know, we've, we've been encouraged to have in our own homes or with our friends or through our microaggressions during our encounters with black people. But there's an irony here, you know, we can see it through the intrinsic self-hate that we have within our community, you know, via shadism, uh, deeming those fellow bumbles of darker complexions as being lesser than, but ironically, we're facing that same discrimination, you know, back home in Sri Lanka by the Sing Sinhalese Buddhist majority and within the South Asian community. So uh, we need to like contextualize that, use that experience we had, you know, back home or within the South Asian community to further support the Black Lives Matter movement that's happening here in the Western world. And, you know, it's through that irony that we see the importance of why we need to stand up and support the Black Lives Matter movement. I think a lot of the hesitancy to get behind the Black Lives Matter movement um, as a Tamil community is because, you know, I, I, I think the, the common refrain is, like, well, what about us? You know, like, what about us? Like, did we not, did we not have 40,000 of our own die back home in May 2009 when, and when we protested and we got up on the gardener and we were ple like pleading um, for somebody to do something? Um, and instead the media focused it on, uh, how we were a disruption to their mother's day and, and, um, you know, just a nuisance really. So, you know, a lot, I think, I, I feel like a lot of the town community, um, is, he is maybe hesitating uh, for some reason to get behind us because they're saying, well, we have problems too. I think, yeah, well, when we, when we were having that moment, you know, when we were on the gardener and we had this feeling that we're here. Uh, crying out of desperation and the world is not listening Sh should we then not understand what the black people are going through through that you know that 100 it, it's years not, like exactly <laughs> you know like we're, we're both we were we knew that helpless feeling helplessness yeah. and if anything the way i look at it is like i know that helplessness and I have to do something or I'm going to encourage other people to show up. And I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I don't think you have to be supporting uh, just because you support Black Lives Movement doesn't mean you still can't speak on Tamil subject matter. Right now, I think what's important, as uh, Roche mentioned, is momentum. Momentum is 
key right now. And it's like, we have to keep like the foot on the gas and what's happening. And you're seeing these companies, slow baby steps that there's some reform, but that comes from momentum. That comes from keeping the, the conversation around what's happening to black lives in America right now and worldwide, but right now in terms of the police brutality. And I think that momentum is important. And like, um, yeah, it's, it, it, it could, it's important not to have the conversation around ourselves, even though we had our struggles. It's, you know, uplifting the black community is in turn also uplifting our community. Like when you bring up the person at the bottom of the totem, they are at the bottom. So it's, it's why wouldn't we want to help the person at the bottom that's even lower than us on the social totem of racism, mm-hmm. right? So if we think it, we've had it hard, we have to help that person. And in turn, it's, it's a, we can't have a crabs in the bucket mentality when it comes to being woke. Right. So, you know, because I, I feel like, I mean, you just got reminded me like this, this, this whole what about us conversation. I guess that was the root of MIA's comments back when, um, you know, she, when it was like the Black Lives Matter Super Bowl conversation. Oh, yeah. And I feel like I did kind of try to defend her or try to explain her reasoning. And now I wonder if I regret that. Um, but like, you know, like, do, do you guys remember what I'm talking about? Like, the, yeah, like yeah. she, she was interviewed. She was just trying to say like, well, you know, like, I mean, black people, like nobody ever talks about Muslim lives matters and stuff. And it's like, it is part of that. And she was doing that out of that same resentment that no one paid attention to you know the the genocide right Mm -hmm. um and i mean certainly i can sympathize with her frustrations throughout her career where she could not get people to pay attention to this issue but once again it's even she is emblematic of our of us as a society where we cannot just lend that floor to these people in their moment of need because it's always we're always going to have that kind of lingering trauma and always like trying to again center ourselves for sure. You know, I, I draw I draw a strong distinction between the two issues only because, you know, what happened in May 2009, that, that affected us in our identity as Tamils, right? Um, in a country that we don't live in, that we don't, we don't participate in because, well, very clearly they didn't want us there, um, which is a sore point. It is a sore point. Like, I think we all get frustrated and, and remember that sense of helplessness thinking about that, right? But, but what's this conversation is is affecting us and our identities as North Americans, as Canadians who contributed, who participated in this. Um, somehow we just inherently knew that we were better, better off or had more opportunities simply because we weren't black. Yeah. And we operated off of that, right? I, I think it's also interesting that we have our own Tamil Culture Month here in Canada. Yeah. Um, you know, so we have the same amount, like the Tamil Culture Month in Canada, the same way the black people have Black History Month in Canada. But Tamil people weren't enslaved by Canada, you know, like, so like black, there's a reason you have Black History Month, black people in Canada were enslaved, they were brought here as slaves, it's part of Canadian history. And somehow we have managed because of our political influence, we have managed an equal amount of that calendar space here in Canada. Um, so I think, you know, there's a certain amount of privilege that comes with us as a Tamil community for, for us to take up that amount of real estate on Canadian soil. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I would say, you know, um, there's, there's this narrative that we have as, as a community here, having fled a war, long history of systematic oppression um, back home. Uh, and we did come here with you know, racial trauma, PTSD, severe mental health issues. And we landed in the streets of Montreal, of Toronto, different parts of Toronto, amongst other marginalized and racialized populations. But as a community in Canada, we have been able to see some upward mobility. Uh, like Rad mentioned, you know, we have some political access um, that we've been able to do as a pretty small community. And to say that is purely a result of hard work would be completely ignorant. You know, while we have experienced uh, back home, very overt and historical sort of uh, racism through policies, legislation and violence, we entered a country um, though with a system, a systematic historical uh, with tactics that are embedded in government institutions that are centered around and against black and indigenous folks primarily and that is our advantage uh right off the bat uh, over our brothers and sisters of the black community you know we face our own barriers while operating in this racist system uh you know acknowledging that although on the face of it all we may have seen success as a community but there's still many of us on the outskirts of that narrative still you know facing incredible hardships in terms of socioeconomic status, access to resources for themselves and their families to make ends meet. 
we did not and presently do not have those same historical barriers uh, in place that are holding us back. So, you know, while we can relate, again, we cannot center ourselves around these events when we speak about it from a Canadian context. But, uh, you know, back to the point, we do have a lot to benefit from ourselves by standing up for Black Lives Matters because we're fighting anti-Black racism and anti-colonialism, two things that we experienced when we were back home, two things that pushed us out, um, you know, but now we're contextualizing ourselves to understand what does that mean when we're in Canada. So. Right. Um, you know, I think this, I think for some people, I think that the pace at which this conversation hit them in the face kind of knocked the wind out of a few people, right? It's just like it happened. Yeah like a weekend almost and yeah. on Instagram, they're like, what is going on? Right. Um, and because seemingly, you know, I think for the past five to 10 years, we've, we've been in this era of diversity and inclusion and, you know, saying all the right things. And uh, we, we've been in that era for quite some time, you know, there are roles for it, there are positions for it. So seemingly on its face, everything seems just fine. Right. Companies have statements saying they're, they're not going to be racist and that we've been satisfied with that. Um, but you know, that's the thing, Roach, to your point, like if we could, if we could so easily, um, relegate our black, um, counterparts to the back of the bus or deny them access to a movie theater just a few short decades ago, what, what would people think that we wouldn't embed that same anti-black racism in our institutions, uh, or in our hearts and minds that would deny them opportunities, right? Um, the reason I bring that up is because, Sean, <coughs> momentum. Right. Momentum right. is one of the big ways that momentum is sustained is in our working lives, right? Our industry. Right. That's where that's where a lot of change is gonna is gonna happen, I think. Um, and you know, we were talking about this a little bit before uh, before we got recording. It's just we've been we didn't want to disrupt a system that seemed to be working for us. We didn't want to make anybody feel too comfortable. Um, we sure as hell didn't want to outrightly say that anybody was racist, you know. Um, and that can be a hard thing to do when you know, the workplace allows you to wave away a lot of things as, oh, they didn't mean it. Oh, or I didn't mean it like that. But, um, you know, this has been a, I'm realizing a lot of things we're doing are unintentionally intentional. And that happens in the workplace quite a lot. So yeah. my question is, how do we, how do we address this um, in industry? I think an interesting, I was watching um, just like a YouTube video about um, how the Rosa Parks movement was so effective and how, um, you know, when black people stopped taking the bus, it was a collective movement to give up convenience. And I feel like a lot of people are, you know, anti-racist. They'll be like, yeah, I'm, I support diversity and uh, I'm not racist. But as soon as you fuck with their privilege or convenience, then they're truly like, oh, I, I, I don't know about this anymore. Mm -hmm. But it's like... Are you willing to sacrifice convenience? You know, and that goes against when we speak about these companies, like the absurdity of Amazon uh, supporting black lives is, is so many ways fucked up that I cannot even like fathom. Like, yeah. and you know, com these companies, and I tweeted about this, but these companies are so quick to give these statements. Just companies, every company, fucking Wendy's, Ben and Jerry, everyone's giving these statements. And you know, a lot of these statements, it's not because they're invested in anti-black racism or fighting it. It's because they fear the stain of being called a racist, mm -hmm. the stain of it, but never actually being racist. They'll, the next week after they're post, posted their black fucking box, they're net back to their racist ways. The company still functions on white supremacy, anti-black racism. So it's like, how do we hold them accountable to actual change? How does that happen? Is, is that an effective tool? You know, um, just the fear of being slapped with the title of being a racist? Is that, is that? I, 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 think it, I think you, I guess you can shame people into action, but I, I don't know how, uh, how long that lasts. I don't know how long that shame lasts. So how yeah, I think there's always a fear of retribution, maybe not immediately, but six months or a year down the road, like when this moment passes, if the momentum doesn't like really like, if it doesn't bowl over 400 years of history, then you all have to deal with like, what is your career going to mean six months or a year down the road when those white supremacist companies then were like, uh huh. And I know you remember that time. Well, no one remembers that time, but us now. Mm -hmm. So again, I mean, to that question of how, how do you sustain this? If it's, if it's, if it's just about shaming people and doing something in the moment, we all, as you said, that's not effective. This is about long-term momentum. How do we instill that in our respective, industries and workplace and our lives how do we do that 
you hire them. You hire them to, you hire the right people with the right perspectives, the right lived experiences to be at that decision-making table. Uh, one of the things that we're, we're seeing a lot, a lot of people give pressure to, to companies about is you release a statement, but if I pull up the stats, your HR stats, they're telling you something different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's, it's, it's not about keeping access to enter the company, but it's their mobility, their upward mobility into executive positions, into leadership positions that will actually result in long-term sustained change for the company. And, you know, sometimes it, 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 it's about, you know, uh, being racialized, it's about your experiences, but it's also about how do they actually embody those values of being anti-racist um, and whatnot. So, you know, it's not about blind recruitment because that doesn't do anything for transform, transformational change in the workplace, but it's about allowing them access to, to enter your company, but then providing them mentorship, promotional opportunities, coaching, and actually retaining them and, and building them up in their organization. Um, because, you know, real systemic change doesn't stop at bringing them to the table. It's about what that conversation means once they're at the table. So I, I think that is, that should be a focus of a lot of companies. Mm. Yeah, I, I think, well, like you're saying, it's the, it's the shift in power is essentially, is, is there's a power imbalance. And like you're saying, it's not enough for just to be invited to the table. But in a lot of these industries are black people in positions of serious power. And, um, you know, that whole black square movement started, it was initially started from the music industry as like, hey, we're going to just pause. I don't know what it was called. Pause for the day. Um, but it's funny because the music industry is like... I would say it's still like it still functions in very like slave like methods in terms of owning, owning, literally owning the artist and their work. Just same like there's there's institutions and industries like the NFL, like the NFL is I still look at it as like it's essentially just looks like an, an extension of slavery. That's what the NFL looks like from the outside. And the music industry is really no different. So it's kind of like, yeah, you can post these statements, but what does your actual company look like? And I'm just speaking on the industry that I participate in and I know, but like some of these contracts are despicable, right? They have the, the, the power over these young black artists almost for their entire life. And these young black artists are signing away their life when they're young and they get tossed a hundred thousand grand in front of them, you know? And, um, that industry is essentially just pillaging black culture, uh, all black lives essentially, and not giving anything back. There's how many black executives are there? How many black label owners are there? When you look at the three majors like Warner, Sony, Universal, you know, there's not many positions of power. And yeah. I think that's, there needs to be a shift in that power. That's why the black community is turning to us now. Um, after having to take that fight by themselves while we kind of looked away because it wasn't really affecting us. But now they're saying, no, this is your problem too. Um, and, I, and I wholeheartedly agree. I, I see this as a personal responsibility um, to make up for my, my cowardice in the past, really. The things I permitted to be said, um, the things I let slide, um, just being aware of the fact that you know, the fact that I'm, my first name is Jessica, I'm Catholic, I'm light-skinned, has given me certain advantages in law. And law has a real problem with a lack of diversity that they're not addressing. And, and in law, it's because, you know, law firms are partnerships. They're, they're not public corporations, they're partnerships. And in that way, they can be very fraternal. Um, you know, anti-blackness can be masked in the, the language of fit and culture, which is so part of the whole recruitment process. Um, it's no coincidence that you recruit after recruit after recruit. Um, we are not hiring black candidates, right? Um, so I see it as a personal responsibility uh, to call it by its name, systemic anti-black racism um, and the Black Lives Matter movement um, in all my workplace settings. Um, and it may cause discomfort. I may, I definitely have gotten awkward silences, but um, I'm happy to keep doing so because if this is gonna be part of the conversation, I have to make it part of the conversation. Um, and, you know, I hope we can kind of do that going forward, right? I wanted to speak to the whole, like when Shan was talking about like kind of the workplace experience too, because it's like, 
it's interesting how, you know, we can very easily be brought in to fill in the role of what you would expect a black person to take on. And we need to be aware of that because I mean, I, certainly I've experienced, I, I am that guy that when I first came on to becoming a film critic, bear in mind, my predecessor was Cameron Bailey. He was a black man at now magazine. Um, he's currently the head of TIFF, but when I came on my first, sorry. And then you just came in right after him. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally like he, Cameron Bailey bounced and I, then it was me. Right. So, but, um, so he's, a, but the thing is my first assignment for now magazine was reviewing an ice cube movie, anything black send rad. Mm. So you, you see the function there, like, and like, um, you know, like I like recently, I'm the one that interviewed Spike Lee. I'm the one that covers Carabana for now magazine. I'm the one that, uh, you know, like, like anything. I mean, it's not that now magazine never had black staff, but the Canadian as uh, film criticism in Canada and film coverage, just basically there's no, there's almost no people of color. So especially when there's uh, things that have to do with black culture, any culture, they would, uh, they, uh, they would bring me in to host that Q and a and stuff uh, as if I, and you know, and I never even questioned my ability to do that. I never questioned wh- whether I should be the one doing that. I was just like, yeah, fuck. Yeah. That's me. Of course I should be doing it. Right. Uh, it's only now that, you know, we, 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 we're talking about that kind of intersect, like how, like, you know, actually having black representation and stuff. And it's not good enough just to get some person of color to fill in your diversity quota. Right. You need black and indigenous representation because those are very specific things. Yeah. Oh, and also, by the way, I should add, even this last story, I was just telling you about the story I wrote about, policing and black mental health why did i write that story right well i mean i can tell you now it doesn't have a freelance budget media is dead and so it, of course it fell on me but again like it's like that is the kind of thing I where like, yeah exactly. like i mean like i it shouldn't be me doing this stuff yeah um yeah i think i think one thing um i totally agree that that representation is important i also think it's important not to let it be framed as something that we're some nice thing we're doing for the black community. This is not some nice thing that we're just doing for the black community. This is intentionally to address our unconscious bias uh, and systemic anti-black racism. Um, because, you know, I think a lot in, in, in the initial parts of this whole, this whole wave, there was a lot of, you know, we got to help black people and they need us and, you know, let's help them out. And, and doing so sounds nice and great, but it deflects personal responsibility, your personal, an understanding of our personal role. Um, so I think that framing is, is really important. Um, and, and being vocal about it, being vocal about it. You know, discomfort is a good thing. I think beautiful things come out of discomfort. Um, I call this a psychological revolution because I, I truly believe it is. We, like, I think it's, all this requires is, the opposite of inaction is what we've been doing for so long. Um, just a change of mindset. And all I really truly believe that all it's going to do is make us freer. All of us. Um, and why wouldn't you want that, right? Um, so those are my personal final thoughts on, on the yeah. um, what are What are all of your, if, you're, if you had parting words uh, for the talent community that's watching today, um, a final message, what would that um, be? I think, I, I think for me, it's, you know, us uh, participating in the fight, not just as, as Tamil people, as people is the least we can do. So there's no patting on yourself on the back for showing up. I mean, it's the least. There are people being killed, literally killed, families being, you know, shattered. So it's the least we can do for the sake of our brothers and sisters in humanity and just the upliftment of people. And um, I think right now it's important to... Um, address what's happening head on. We need to take a step back, decenter ourselves from the conversation. And one thing I think we all need to do is think about how to contribute in an effective way and in a purposeful way. Because I think a, a, a lot of people are pointing fingers of how you're participating in this fight. But you know, like in a, in a war, you would never place the archers in the front because they're, they only work long distance. And I feel like all of us have a particular gift or a power or a skill set that we can contribute. And we need to focus on that and how that could be useful in this fight. Instead of, you know, all of us don't have to be doing the same thing. Like it's better that some people stay off social media, you know, and it's better like some people are very informative and great curators of information and they should be on social media. So I think it's a time to reflect on how you could personally contribute and how you could also give up a lot of your personal conveniences long term for the fight. For sure. 
Um, Roche, what's your final message to the people? Get used to being uncomfortable um, and really assume the role of being that person uh, is something I've said a lot. You know, I saw somewhere that you, you, you can't be anti-racist and conflict avoidant. You know, you're, you, it's something that you're going to have to deal with. You're going to have to deal with the conflict, the uncomfortable conversations, the awkward silences uh, you're going to get from all your, your, your white colleagues or your racist colleagues or what have you. Um, but, you know, I really, really push you to, to be that person. Um, you know, I always say, like, and a lot of people might agree, like, but being Tamil, like, it's in your, it's in your blood to be fighters. Um, but now is not your time, but it will benefit you in the long run. Not that you should be doing something because there is a benefit for you, but just understand, you know, the role you play in terms of how you contribute to it and also how fighting this fight will have benefits for everybody for the greater good. Maybe not for white people, but it's about time, right? Um, but so that would be sort of the thing that I encourage to the Dhamma community. Brad, why don't you close us off? Uh, I hate this task because these guys have like such great quotes and I don't have that kind of stuff. Like, quote <laughs> material. you know, what? I just want to, I want to, I want to bring up a fact that I, I mean, like, so I only have one more kind of point to bring out that maybe should have been a message earlier. It's not exactly a great closing thought, but whatever, I'm going to close with it anyway. We have to recognize our privilege. And I know a lot of us will be like, what, what privilege? I struggled or whatever. Right. But I mean, just as an example, you were talking earlier about black people are 20 times more likely to die at the hands of police. You know, we've seen these stats. We've seen them literally within the last month. DeAndre Campbell, Regis Korczynski, Prakat, these people who have died when police came into their situations. I want to go back to that period where Tamil people were all over the news because of their gang wars and stuff, right? Going back to 99. Not one of those people died at the hands of police. And they were stalking the police's homes. They were uh, taking down their license plates, those Tamil gangsters back then. They were taking down their license plates, following them to their homes, doing all that kind of behavior, and yet even they did not get killed by police. So we have a certain amount of privilege, and we get, we get a certain uh, benefit of the doubt when we interact with police that black people do not afford. So we do have to recognize our privilege. Yeah, 100. for sure. That's not privilege. No. To, to just have access to your life, to just be able to live freely, if that's not privilege, I really don't know what that is. Um, all right, guys. Whew. Can I take a deep breath? Let's take a deep breath. <laughs> <sighs> I honestly feel a little lighter after this conversation. I think, like I said, I think checking ourselves um, is important and coming to this understanding individually, but also as a community is, is part of that process. So um, thank you guys for being here. Rishani, thank you. John Vincent Paul, Brad. Thanks for um, having me. Yeah, for sure. This is great. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. And we will see you soon.